Hi everyone, this is Professor Dunham, and I'm going to do week two weekly review on chapter four. Chapter four is a really important chapter. It covers prenatal care and adaptations to pregnancy. And I'm gonna point out the importance of prenatal care. Okay, so I'm gonna start out and share my screen. So it keeps me right on track. All righty, okay. And here we are, chapter four. Alrighty, put me out of the way here. And here we are, chapter four, okay? Shows you all the different aspects of the pregnancy. And our little guy in the middle has our fetus, and this is what we are going to achieve, a healthy pregnancy, okay? In order to have a healthy fetus. Alrighty, um, these are the different phases of pregnancy. They have our antepartum before birth, or intrapartum during birth, or your postpartum after birth, okay? And this is what we're striving for, is a really um, healthy little baby, okay? I'm just going to go into the major goals of prenatal care. So, again, we want a healthy mom, and we want a safe birth for mother and child. And how we're going to do all this is we're going to promote good health habits for mom and reduce her risk factors, okay? So we want to know her medical history, her surgical history, and her obstetrical history, okay? And by, you know, teaching her good health habits, you know, she can continue those good health habits all the way to the end, all the way to her whole entire life, okay? So it's always good to go over things that can help the patient be healthier. Um, educating her self-care during the pregnancy, take care of thyself and then provide physical care. And of course, prepare parents for responsibilities of parenthood. All right, so ideally prenatal care should begin prior to a pregnancy. And we call that preconception care. And it would be because we could get we could identify risk factors before she even gets pregnant. And I'm thinking of one, I'm thinking of rubella. Rubella, you, uh, you don't want to get that during pregnancy because it is a teratogen to the fetus. It can cause severe abnormalities. So if I can get her in before she gets pregnant, I can get a rubella tighter on this patient, okay? Then I could know if she's immune or not. And if she's not immune, okay. that's okay. But then I would give her the vaccine and then I would tell her to wait one month before she get pregnant. Because you never give a live vaccine to a pregnant woman. And then I can you know, assess her nutritional state because not every woman eats healthy. We're, too, we're just too busy, okay, doing, uh, taking care of a lot of other people to take care of ourselves. And that's what we talk about, self-care. Um, ensure adequate intake of folic acid to prevent an open neural tube defect, such as spina bifida or hydrocephalus. So folic acid is very important. So, you know, you want to get her history. And we're going to start out with the obstetrical history. And we're going to talk about um, gravita and para, and we're going to talk about then the complete five-digit obstetrical history, which is gravita term, prematurity, AB mis or miscarriages, and living. That gives me a complete picture of her obstetrical history. Now, we do that in the first, very first visit to get to know it, but every time she comes in, she'd be grouped under gravita and para. Now, gravita, write this down. Gravita refers to any pregnancy and to the number of times a woman has been pregnant, regardless of the duration or outcome. Okay. And don't forget, it includes the present pregnancy. Now, when you got para, para refers to the number of pregnancies that have reached 20 weeks um, or greater. So these that's gravid para. So she's coming in for her first pregnancy. She's a gravid of one, okay, number of pregnancies. She's got one. 
is the present one. And then para would be zero because she doesn't have any um, children. Maybe reach 20 weeks of grade. She's the first pregnancy. Got it? Gravid and para. Okay. And then, of course, we'll go over, you know, her history, her medical history, her, her um, genetic makeup, and then um, see if there's any risk factors in the woman's and partner's history to identify any kind of risk problems, and then psychosocial. All righty. So if I was to ask you, a woman is coming in for her first prenatal visit and is determined that she's eight weeks pregnant. Okay. So which tests are typically performed at the first prenatal visit and a low risk pregnancy? So you want to select all that apply. So we know HIV, we're going to do, okay? Um, got to find out if she is positive or not. Complete blood count. Yes, because I want to know her H and H because I want to know if she's anemic. I'm going to skip down to rubella because we talked about that. Rubella, titer, absolutely going to get it because I need to know if she's immune or not. And then vaginal culture, going to get a vaginal culture, okay? Okay. So the only one that I would not select for a first prenatal visit, blood work, um, and because she, she's low risk, would be a glucose tolerance test. That would be in the second trimester, and we would do a screening test first, because she's low risk. We do a screening test first, and then if she fails the screening test, then we would order a three-hour glucose tolerance test. So make sure when you're dealing with questions in maternity that you read the entire question, okay? Because things could be, there. there's hints in the question as to what we're asking. So this one, going back to the question, would be her first prenatal visit. That gives you a hint. It's not each, is the first one. And then... They're asking which tests are typically performed, okay, at the first prenatal visit. And this one tells you she's a low-risk pregnancy. So that gives you another hint as to which one you're looking for. Now, you have to read the entire question. So I know students skip over a lot of reading the questions, and they, they just say, oh, that's what, that's what she's asking. But no, read the entire question. All right, so I'm going to go into some objectives on the pelvic exam. Um, I want to go over, you know, you're going, when we evaluate the size and adequacy and condition of the pelvis and reproductive organs, when we're looking at, you know, her measurements and um, if she's if she uh, has a good gynecoid pelvis, all right, because that's most optimal for a vaginal delivery is your gynecoid. Okay. Now, I'm also going to look for signs of pregnancy, and then we group them under three different areas. So we've got the probable signs, which are signs that are picked up by the examiner, okay? A positive sign is a pretty good sign that you are pregnant, and that would be like an ultrasound where you see actually the fetus. And then a presumptive sign is a sign that's felt by the woman herself. And, um, you know, she's the one that's feeling it, okay? But if they're not all positive until you get to that real positive, which is your ultrasound, all right. Now, we these are recommended schedule of prenatal visits that's uncomplicated pregnancy. So you got from conception to 28 weeks, we should have to come every four weeks. Not so bad, okay? So our advanced maternal age, business type woman, that's not too demanding at the beginning of pregnancy. And then when she turns 29 weeks to 36 weeks, we're gonna see a little more often because she's getting more advanced. Remember she's in like, what, the second trimester. So she's got, because every trimester is 13 weeks. So that would be the second trimester. That's not too bad, okay? Every two to three weeks, depending upon if, you know, if she's still low risk or have she, she, if something happened that she's now high risk. When you have a high risk pregnancy, they're seen more often. Now, 37 weeks to birth. So she's term here. And so we come in weekly. Things can change very rapidly. And so we want to make sure we keep a close eye on the growing fetus. And then in your book, um, page, I believe it's page 50, 
there is a good table um, and it shows you the different trimesters and it shows you the different diagnostic tests that are included in each trimester. All right, now let's go back to your um, antepartum nursing care. Remember before birth, okay. So again, we're going to summarize by saying, get her history. We're gonna get her surgical history, medical history and obstetrical history. We use two methods. You got the gravidum period we talked about and then you got the GTPAL. Now, they're gonna assist the physician with the exam and you can calculate gestational age using the Nagel rule and we'll go over that in just a minute. And then you can do, um, as a practitioner, the practitioner can perform a 10 week gestation ultrasound. And the reason why we're doing that is to get a crown rump measurement, crown rump. All right, now, I know that some students love to put in, oh yeah, at every prenatal visit you get an ultrasound. I'm here to tell you, no, okay? So 10, you do two, two ultrasounds during pregnancy on a routine low risk pregnancy. And so she would have one done about 10 weeks and that's when they come in and we're looking for the fetal heart rate, heart pumping, okay? Then we know we have a fetus in there, okay? So that's at 10 weeks gestation. And again, we can do that great crown rump where we measure from the top of the um, fetus, okay, to the bottom, all right. And then we can get a really good measurement of how many weeks gestation she is. Okay. Now, we're also in the very beginning of pregnancy, we're going to you know, get her blood pressure, um, first, we're going to get a weight. Then we're going to get a blood pressure and know what we're dealing with. Then we get her pulse, okay, and make sure it's normal. And then we're going to get all her blood work. So that would be your first visit. And then you have your ultrasound, okay? We've got to confirm by doing an ultrasound that we have a viable fetus in there. Because if we didn't have see the heart beating on that first ultrasound, we could actually have a cluster of cells it never formed properly, and that's called a molar pregnancy. And we'll discuss that in another chapter as a complication. So here's a good, good picture of our lab work that's done at the first visit, okay? Not every visit, but the first visit. So again, HIV testing, CBC, rubella, titer, Hepatitis B, RPR, looking for syphilis, BDRL, okay, again, venereal disease, RH and blood type when anybody screened. Got to know if she's a mom has A positive or A negative. We need to know that RH, RH type. So if she's negative, we want to make sure that we mark her chart to give her Rogam during the pregnancy. And of course, we're going to do vaginal cultures such as gonorrhea and chlamydia. And if she has a history of sickle cell, we'll do hemo, hemoglobin electrophoresis if she needs to be done. And of course, a urinalysis to make sure we don't start out with, you know, a UTI, because uh, that could throw her into labor and she could lose a baby because of that. Because remember, the bladder lays right underneath the uterus. All right. And so, and then we're, you know, we got some foods that are always recommended. And, you know, you have your vegetables, you know, things that are on your plate that are colorful are the best. Fish, you know, red meats, you know, everything in moderation. Fish like tuna is not good. Anything that crawls on the bottom of the ocean is not good because it could contain mercury. That's what we're getting after. Um, now, these are routine assessment at each prenatal visit. This is important, okay, because you might see this again, but our risk factors, always, 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 we want to be on the side of prevention. And then we have our vital signs, like I talked about, and, and the weight, your urinalysis. You know, that those little easy dipsticks that we do, you know, we take the urine and dip the urine, dip, dipstick in the urine. Those are really great because it shows protein, glucose, ketones, albumin, really, really good. And then we can pick up a lot of things just from that little dipstick. Blood work, if she needs to, you can do a finger stick on hemoglobin. Um, let's see, fundal height, 
We always check to see the baby is growing by measuring her fundus, fundal height. So we measuring what we're measuring, we're measuring the uterus. And by doing that, we can measure, we can estimate how big this baby is. All right. And then leave a pose maneuver. We'll put our hands on top of the belly and we can check and see what position the baby's in and, how, and actually how big this baby is. And then nutritional intake, always going to ask her how she's doing her food. And, you know, may, she may have, um, you know, er, you know, cravings, cravings such as pica, you know, P-I-C-A. Those are abnormal cravings, but, you know, they they happen in pregnancy. Like, say, for instance, the reason why I say abnormal, because, you know, not everybody eats soil, okay? This occurs in pregnancy where women will have a craving for these kind of foods, like, like chalk. They can eat chalk, starch, you know, all different types of non-food items. And that's called, again, pica, P-I-C-A, and you will see that again. And it's okay. It's normal. All right. Now she may not think it's normal, but she has these cravings. So she has to, you know, eat it to, to satisfy that craving. What as a nurse, what you're interested to know is how much of say that chalk that she's eating, how much of that soil is she eating? Okay. That's what's your, your role as a nurse. Okay. You're not there to say, Ooh, how can you eat that? No, no, no. You want to support her, knowing it's a normal phenomenon that happens during pregnancy and that it's okay. It's okay. Just want to know how much of it are you are you eating? Okay. So we have, you know, minimal nutritional increases where during the pregnancy, she can actually have 300 more calories. Okay. I also want to encourage her to increase her protein by 30 grams per day, increase iron and folic acid through the pregnancy, through her diet and supplements, and then increase uh, intake of vitamin A, C, and calcium through the, her diet. I also encourage my patients to have lots of fluids, keep hydrated, and drink a total of 8 to 10 glasses of fluid per day. I like them to have like four to six glasses of just plain old water per day, okay? Keep them hydrated because when you keep a woman hydrated, it keeps that uterus actually quiet because the uterus, may, 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 remember, the uterus is made up of three different muscle fibers. And when a muscle gets dehydrated, okay, it starts to quiver. It's the same thing happens with the uterus. When the uterus gets dehydrated, it starts to quiver and therefore she will contract and therefore then the cervix will open up and she will deliver. We don't want her to deliver prematurely. We don't want them to lose their babies in the beginning of, of the pregnancy. So we want to make sure that she keeps that uterus nice and quiet. We talked about some vaginal discharge before when we did our cultures. And so you know, bacterial vaginosis is, is the most common during pregnancy, and um, it happens because there's an increase in, in circulating um, bacteria and other anaerobic um, microorganisms. It's kind of a milky white discharge, and so we want to make sure that we get that under control because it can cause irritation, and it has been um, associated with preterm labor. Now, what's your role during each prenatal care? Okay, so what's your role? Because LPNs can um, work in an OBGYN, OBGYN office, and they are the ones that will be doing the histories. So you want to make sure that you're on top of everything. So you're going to collect the data from the pregnant woman. Okay, remember all the information, that medical history, surgical history, obstetrical history. You're going to identify, and maybe every time she comes in, you reevaluate some risk factors, okay? Um, educating self care, and then providing nutritional counseling, okay? A lot of times you can refer them to like that um, government agency, you know, myplate.gov. And, you know, that's a good place to start to use when you're talking about nutrition. Because a lot of nurses don't feel comfortable talking about nutrition, but you can buy, you know, using that website. 
Now, promoting family adaptation to pregnancy. How's everybody handling pregnancy? How's your husband doing? How's how are you doing first? Okay. Um, are you are you are you able to adapt to the changes that, that you that's occurring in your body? Okay. You want to know that. And then you want to know how's your husband handling it? Okay. And um making sure that the bond is there between the parents. Okay. And then of course you got grandparents, you got other people. Remember, you got entire family that is being affected by the pregnancy. This is a screen that's just some terms that are related to pregnancy. Um, we went over already the gravita. Um, the null gravita is that she's never been pregnant. The prima gravita, first time, um, first time going on it. They need a little more education than your multigravita that has been in there before and she's pregnant again. And so, and she could be on her third or fourth baby. So she knows the routine. Don't have to help them though. You have to encourage because sometimes they like to skim through. And then of course, pair the number of pregnancies that have reached 20 weeks or greater. Okay. Your average pregnancy is 40 weeks, okay, or 280 days after your first day of your last normal menstrual period. And we always give that plus or minus two weeks. Yeah, that, that, that's a good thing. Now, you can use, you can calculate her EDC or EDD by using Nagel's rule. All right. So all you do is, you know, you, she tells you her first day of her last normal period. Okay. All right. And then, so if she's using, say, September, then you would, you go back three months. So, so go back three months. And so that if it's September, so it would be what? August, July, and June. June, July, August. Right? Okay. All right. And then, um, so you go back three months and then that first day of that date of the first day, you would just add seven days to that first date. And then, of course, if you need to go to the next year, you know, you, you add, add a year if it's applicable. All right. So let's go this one. Determine the EDD using Nagel's rule for a woman who LMP began on January the 7th and ended on January the 12th. A lot of times they will do that. They will put that other date in there and you go, uh-oh, uh-oh, you know, because you're used to seeing one date. So you know that is from the first day of that last normal menstrual period, okay? So this one, it was January the 7th. So then you're going to go now January. So I'm going to start by counting back three months. So what do I got? December, November, October, right? October, November, December. Okay. All right. And then, so I got October. So I got my month and I see, oh, all the choices say October. So now I'm going to add seven days to that first day. So it says here began on January the 7th. That's my first day. So seven plus seven is 14. So she's due October the 14th. All right. Now that would be the same year. Okay. All right. How about we do this one? A woman LMP began on May the 4th. Okay. And using Nagel's rule, which date would be correct to estimate her delivery day? So again, we're going to go back. So May, okay. So it'll be April. March, right? February, right? So February, March, April. Yeah, February, March, April. See, you have to kind of either write it down or you're going to have to say it back and forth a little time. So February. So it began on May the 4th, okay? So seven days added to May the 4th would be what? The 11th. So her due date would be what? February the 11th. I'm going over to the next year, so it'll be the next year, Okay. So just my hint is if on your scrap paper, you know, if you need to write out the months to do that too. Um, because these things, Nagel's rule is always on HESI, always. Okay, they always have at least one question on that. And of course, Gravit and Para, there's always a question on Gravit and Para and GTPAL. Okay, and that will be also on, on exam one. These are all good questions. Okay. So now we're going to go into, remember I said they're trimesters. So there's three trimesters and they're divided. This is how pregnancy is divided. 
is easy because then and each trimester, each group, we know, you know, like what to do, what to expect. And um, it's laid out for you very well, like I said, in your book on page 50. All right. So there's three 13 week parts. And it's good to know because, you know, that's like like um, in your book, um, the chart tells you exactly like what lab tests should be done. You know, the first first visit, first go around, first trimester is important because let me just move my book outside here and get to page 50 for you. Yep, page 50. And it's good to know what happens and what to expect. You know, all the blood work is done in the beginning because we want to get a baseline. And then as she moves into her second trimester, you know, we know the baby's growing more. And so we know the demands on mom's body is more. So we want to test to see how her body is handling the extra circulating um, sugars. So we're going to do that screening test, okay, for the glucose during the second trimester. Um, and, and so we want to get that done. And then, you know, we're going to follow up with any kind of extra for tests, maybe offer the alpha beta protein test. I believe that's in your book, um, alpha beta protein test during the second trimester. And that's to look for Down syndrome babies or um, maybe a chance of, to know if she has an open neural tube defect. So these are things that we want to make sure that we see if there's any kind of um, things going kind of haywire. Um, so we want to know that. And if she has a positive alpha beta protein test, again, that's a screening test. Then we would uh, advise her to have an amniocentesis, which is a diagnostic test. Okay, so let's go with, let's go and discuss the signs of pregnancy. Remember, we, we talked a little bit about them already. We said the presumptive signs, the probable signs, and then the positive signs. So let's start with the presumptive signs. And positive is meant, I mean, excuse me, presumptive is what the woman feels, okay? It's felt by the woman. So in presumptive is a big old you, okay? That gives you a hint as to you, the woman. Um, so she comes in, she tells you, I haven't had a period. So that's called amenorrhea, where there's no periods. But other things can cause amenorrhea in a woman, not just pregnancy. So, okay, you take that down. Then the woman comes in, she tells she has nausea and vomiting. Okay, but she could have a stomach flu. Um, breast changes, yes. Um, maybe they're more, the breasts are more tender, more sensitive. So she could um, be drinking too much caffeine, which causes breast tenderness. So let's let's see. Um, sometimes they have pigmentation that increases on the skin. Those, those are skin changes. But let's let's just not that she's feeling them. Remember, the woman is feeling them. And then urinary frequency and urgency of, of urination. Well, that's real common in pregnancy, but it's also very common when she has a urinary tract infection. Okay, so you get a urine. And then she could be complaining of fatigue. And again, of course, that could be from the beginning of pregnancy, but also she could be anemic. Um, and she may not be eating all her proteins and um, foods that are high in iron. And so maybe she is anemic. So let's check that out. And then, of course, she may be feeling some things in her tummy. She's, oh, I th I'm feeling something, nurse. But she could be having gas pains, maybe some inflammation of the colon. So it could be something other than pregnancy. That's what we call those signs that are felt by the woman herself, presumptive signs. Now, the next group of signs of pregnancy are probable signs. These are signs that the examiner themselves they discover okay so again when i'm looking at the cervix um as an examiner i can see maybe some purplish bluish discoloration of the cervix hmm that's the chadwick sign if i have a sign that's i, I feel the cervix and it's starting to get real soft hmm. 
Again, that's a Cradell sign. And then when I'm in there feeling, not only am I feeling the softening of the cervix, but I feel that maybe there's some softening of that lower uterine segment, okay? That's again, that's a Hager sign. And then if I have flexing, the uterus actually flexes against the cervix, all right? That's um, the, the McDonald sign. So these are signs that the examiner sees, okay? Now, the last sign is called the positive sign of pregnancy. And that is the ultrasound that you, you do at 10 weeks and you visualize that there is a fetus, there's a heartbeat. And so that's pretty positive that you are pregnant, okay? And again, you hear the heartbeat, that's positive. Again, these are, you can't, these are, these are down packed positive signs that you're pregnant. Okay. And then if I do my lure pulse maneuver, where I put my hands on her abdomen to feel, you know, for the, for the fetus, you know, that's actually um, another sign of pregnancy. That's pretty positive. So to summarize, you have these, you know, different signs, the presumptive, the probable and the positive sign. And again, the presumptive are signs that these are signs that actually are very much frequently associated with pregnancy, but there's a chance that it could be related to something else. But those are the signs that the woman herself feels. Now, the other sign is the probable, and those are signs that are actually um, done by the examiner. The examiner is checking her to see how big the, her uterus, uh, her, her pelvis is, and he feels a lot of softening of the cervix, and maybe the lower uterine segment, a practitioner sees that, okay? Those are probable. All right. And then, of course, we do the ultrasound, and that's a positive sign is the ultrasound. So a good test question could be related to list the probable signs or list the presumptive signs or list the positive sign, okay? So if I was to ask you this question, okay? And an antenatal client is informing the nurse of her prenatal signs and symptoms. Okay. So which of the following finding would the nurse determine if is a probable sign of pregnancy? Again, then you think about it. So you just say, okay, presumptive would be the woman. Okay. Probable is the, oh, is what the examiner sees. And this one's asking me, what's a probable sign of pregnancy? Oh, okay. So let me look at my choices. Oh, the Chadwick sign. That's seen by the um, by the examiner. Okay, it's the, the bluish purplish discoloration of the cervix. Okay, the other one is amenorrhea. That's presumptive. Quickening is presumptive and breast tendons is presumptive. Those are all signs that are felt by the woman. Bingo, you got it. And that's a, that's a pretty good question. You know, you think about it. Okay, so let's go to some normal changes in the body, okay? So, all right, first we're going to start out with the endocrine system. Okay, now these are, these are all body systems in a pregnant woman that are going to change, okay? So, we got the addition of the placenta. The placenta is a temporary endocrine organ, Okay. And it does produce a large amount of estrogen and progesterone. Okay, remember, we need those to maintain the pregnancy. Remember, we talked about progesterone maintaining a pregnancy because it decreases contractibility of the uterus. So we need those. Okay, and then we know about estrogen because estrogen stimulates uterine growth. So we know that. All right. So, yes, we got the endocrine system. Now we go move to the uh, reproductive system and the uterus. The uterus changes from a pear shaped little shaped organ that's tucked down in that pelvis. All right. Now it's going to grow and it's going to grow out of the pelvis and into the abdominal cavity. All right. Again, you know, it's pushing all her intestinal organs way up high. Okay. Respiratory. Now, the respiratory, she's going to breathe deeper and she gets increased O2 consumption by 15%. Yeah, and you know, everything gets pushed up. So even those lungs get pushed back to the back. 
Now your cardiovascular system, you get the whole picture. This is, and this is, we've just gone through the endocrine system, the reproductive organs and the pelvis. We've done the, the lungs. Now we're going to do the heart. So now we have increased cardiac output, at least 45 to 50% more volume because more blood is pumped by the heart because there is demands for more blood, okay? So fetus needs blood because blood carries oxygen. Fetus needs oxygen, needs blood to grow. So her little heart is going to work a little harder. So therefore you would think, yes, the pulse rate has to increase. And it has to increase significantly enough to keep up with all the demands. That's why if, you're, if your patient came in in the beginning of the pregnancy with a risk factor such as cardiovascular disease, this would be putting a big, big burden on her heart is pregnancy. Gastrointestinal, remember the growing uterus displaces the stomach and the intestines are pushed toward the back of her, okay? That's why she can't eat large meal when she gets to be in the second, third trimester, especially is because everything is pushed way high and you can't, she don't have much room there to eat a full meal. <coughs> That's why we say small frequent meals are the best. And then urinary system. So this system now, her urinary system has to work harder. It has to work harder to excrete waste products from both herself and the fetus during pregnancy. Then her skin, okay. You can, can, now do you get the picture? Pregnancy changes everything in a woman's body, including her skin. And she will get like straight A, straight A gravidarum, which are stretch marks. She has a linea negra, which is that dark line going up her abdomen. She could get chalasma of her, on her face, which is called a mask of pregnancy. And the, you know, all the, she gets much more deeper pigmentation of her skin. Now, the linea negra does go away, thank goodness, okay? Um, the stretch marks do not go away because the skin actually has to stretch. And if, and, and if there's a sudden weight gain where she all of a sudden the uterus just grew tremendously fast, um, she's going to have stretch marks, okay? The skin can stretch, but it can stretch. It stretch it's, it's best to stretch it slow, slowly rather than too fast, So the next couple of slides are going back over the endocrine system and I can take a look at that and you can see the primary role of the endocrine system is to produce estrogen and progesterone. Those are two hormones that you need, like we talked about. Um, we talked about the uterus becoming a temporary abdominal organ. It has the, the uterus has to house the baby so you have like a capacity of what, 5,000 mLs. So we have the placenta, you have the amniotic fluid, and you have the fetus, quite a bit, okay? The cervix, again, it changes in color and consistency. And then um, you have the mucus plug where that's like, like at, at the neck of the uterus in order that it prevents any kind of bacteria from getting up inside the uterus. And then you have your ovaries and they produce your progesterone um, and the, and to maintain the decidua um, during, you know, implantation. And that's in the very beginning of, of the pregnancy. Okay. So in the vagina itself, um, you have increased blood supply, like we talked about. That's why you get that bluish purplish coloring, just coloring of the congestion of the vascular system down in the in, inside the cervix. It's very vascular area, it bleeds easily. And the vaginal secretions, they become, the pH becomes more acidotic and you have a, a higher glycogen level because don't forget the placenta itself secretes a hormone HPL, human placental lacogen. And so you can get candida albicans, the growth of yeast a lot easier. And the breasts, the breasts will increase in size because they're getting prepared for um, lactation, which is breastfeeding. So you have a higher level of estrogen. And then the, even the tubules of Montgomery, they secrete a substance that will lubricate the nipples. So the body is getting ready by increasing. Uh, here, 
this is uh, the height of the fundus during gestation we talked about. And every visit, we're going to do this. So let me make this a little bigger for you to see. And you can see where the practitioner puts the, the beginning of the of the um, tape measure, okay, a zero. And he puts it down at the sympathous pubis right here, okay. And then he comes straight up the linea negra because the linea negra is the line go up straight up the belly. Linea negra to where he gets to the top of the uterus, which is called the fundus, and then he measures. So this is where, you know, if you measure, like she's supposed to be 26 weeks gestation, then she should measure 26 centimeters, okay? And if she doesn't measure 26 centimeters and she is smaller, like maybe 24, that means the baby is going to, it's a small baby. What's going on inside? Um, on the other hand, if she's larger than those 26 centimeters, um, and it could be that she's measuring 28 or 30 centimeters, that's a large baby. You know, you think, okay, what's going on? Why do I have a large baby? Maybe I had to send her out for a glucose screening a little earlier to, to determine. Um, maybe I have polyhydromatos. So now we we're, we are identifying some risk factors, okay, that we need to address. And this is so, it's so simple to do, but so great, okay? It gives us great information. And over here, you can see how the uterus will grow. This is a great picture. So you see down here in the beginning of the pregnancy where it's tucked down inside the pelvis, which is nice in the very beginning. It, it protects it and this lets it grow. And then as about 10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks are showing here, um, now the uterus is coming out of the pelvis and becomes an abdominal organ. Halfway through the pregnancy, she should be at the level of her belly button, the umbilicus, okay? And then it keeps growing, okay? So it gets very uncomfortable for her. Remember, respirations change. Her heart rate increases. That's because everything is pushed up. There's such a demand on her body um, for more blood. So the cardiac um, output is increased and um, breathing is increased. She gets short of breath. She can't climb those stairs like she, she could have. And then it comes all the way up here. About 40 weeks, it comes right above her xiphoid process. And then when the baby starts to engage, that means he descends now down downward um, and lower in the pelvis. She actually can start breathing a lot, a little bit easier because now the pressure is off. Okay, so that's one thing that's good when they start to engage. The head engages. So we we talked about. The respiratory system already, but again, just to clarify, oxygen consumption increases by 15%. The diaphragm kind of raises a little bit and kind of stretches out a little bit, causes those ribs to flare. Okay. Um, she can have some dyspnea or difficulty in breathing until that fetus, I told you, descends into the pelvis. That's called engagement. And then, you know, you have increased estrogen again, which causes you to have those nosebleeds. Yeah, plus some swelling in the nose. But she could have a little bit of breathing problem too, because now she's got some some edema and swelling of the mucous membranes. Okay, not easy, no. And so this is where your nosebleeds and nasal stuffiness can come in. Um, heart again, just to reiterate, the heart increases by. Um, your blood volume increases by 45 to 50 percent. Okay, the heart, you know, is has to pump more blood. There's more pressure, so there's a lot of things that need it. The baby needs it. You know, that placenta. Remember the placenta. The placenta is going to take a lot, and so because you have this exchange of nutrients and oxygen and waste products within the placenta, and then um, mom, mom has extra maternal tissues that needs more blood. Because you need blood in the body to circulate the oxygen, and all the vital, all vital organs in a person's body needs oxygen. And then we're going to lose a lot of blood at birth because remember the uterus is vascular, the cervix is vascular, everything is increased, and so she's going to lose a lot at birth. And this is where the body is able to compensate for that loss, sudden loss of blood at at, at childbirth. Okay, and then you have 
The pulse increase, we said about 10 to 15 beats per minute to keep up with the demands of the heart during pregnancy. Alrighty. Um, let's go over supine hypotension syndrome. Okay, so one thing I want you to remember is just don't put a pregnant woman on her back, okay? Don't do that, all right? Because when she lays on her back, she can, a lot of pressure. Don't, don't forget, you got about a good 5,000 mLs of fluid in that uterus. You got the fetus, you got the placenta, you got the amniotic fluid, and that presses right against down against her inferior vena cava. Okay, and when that presses the inferior vena cava, the mom doesn't get the oxygen and the blood she needs. All right, so there she's therefore she's going to feel not so good anymore. She's maybe have feeling fainty. She'll say, "Oh, nurse, I don't feel too good. I really feel fainty. I'm going to I'm going to pass out." She may get dizzy, you know, lightheaded, and if you don't change her, she's going to get really agitated because you know she's not feeling good. She has all these different feelings and it's not a it's not a pleasant feeling to feel this way. So what can the nurse do? Remember this. The nurse turns her patient over to the left side. Put her into a lateral position, please, and preferably on the left side because you get more um, placenta perfusion. So you want to increase that. You, you want to get blood to the fetus. You want to get more blood to the placenta. Therefore, the baby gets more blood. Baby gets more oxygen. It all connected. So just turn her off her back and on her side, such as my little picture here of this mom snuggled in her pregnancy pillow. And she's got lots of good support for that, for that, for that growing uterus. See there? Gets a lot of pressure off her back. Um, making her feel better, giving more blood to the fetus and, um, and and support for the growing abdomen, okay? And then by doing that too, it gets the pressure off the ligaments. You know, sometimes um, pregnant ladies get ligament pain and you can help her there that way also. So here you go. So here's your inferior vena cava. You can see here, the, the, how the pressure of everything can be on that and how it could decrease oxygen flow to mom. And this shows you actually uh, a uterus during contraction, which contractions put out a good effective contraction puts out like 50 millimeters of mercury. And so it's a lot of pressure. So you don't want to have laying in her back during a contraction because the baby will not like it at all. His heart rate will go down. He'll get bradycardic on you. Okay, so again, we talked about the effects. So we we'll just recap, orthostatic hypotension, blood pressure will go down, palpitations. She may have anemia. She may have the pseudonemia. Let me tell you, pseudonemia um, is what we call dilutional um, anemia, where you have so much more blood volume circulating, you have more fluid going, um, that it could dilute the um, amount of blood factors in the blood. So it could, sh it could show as basically um, anemia, but it's not true anemia, it's pseudo anemia. And then of course, clotting factors do increase in the second and third trimesters. So you have to be very careful of that because then she's at more risk for a thrombophobitis or a DVT. So you wanna be very careful. So if I was to ask you a question now, so let's, let's do it. The nurse educating a pregnant woman in her last trimester will encourage her to sleep on her side because what? What will it do? It will prevent hypotension. Okay, good. All right, the GI system, you have a growing uterus, which displaces your stomach intestines, like we said, um, increased saliva, appetite, yeah, it could increase. Um, why not, right? You're pregnant. Okay. Then gastric acid secretions, they kind of decrease because you have delay in gastric emptying and intestinal movement. Okay. Again, related to progesterone and estrogen, they relax the muscle tone of the gallbladder and in the intestinal tract. And what happens, she can get um, pruritus because she has more bile salts, bile salt in the gallbladder. A lot of women do 
have problems with the gallbladder during pregnancy because of this. Again, related to progesterone and estrogen. And they have decreased intestinal movement, so therefore they're more prone to constipation. So this just shows you the compression of the abdominal contents as uterine uterus enlarges. Um, the urinary system, again, she needs to excrete or get rid of waste products. And not only from herself, but from the baby. So you have the glomerular filtration rate of the kidneys will increase because they're working really hard. And then you may have some glycouria, which is glucose in the urine, and some protein in the urine. It's not getting rid of. So we got to be careful of water retention due to increased blood volume and dissolving nutrients provided for the fetus. Okay. So again, our friend progesterone causes renal, pelvis, and uterus to lose tone, and which leads to urinary stasis, which leads to UTIs. It's all connected. So do I want her to drink at least four to six glasses of water? Just water per day? Yes. Okay. And then getting to the skeletal integumentary, I talked about the stridae gravidarum, the spina, spider nevi, the little spider veins. <coughs> they don't go away either. And sweat and sebaceous glands become more active. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing for a woman to start having this really a lot of sweating. But it's normal. Um, posture changes are big in pregnancy because of the growing tummy, growing uterus in the, in the beginning. Puts a lot of pressure on the back so she can get low back aches. Okay, just have somebody give you a nice massage. And they have actually um, massages you can go to. You have to get a, a doctor's order, but you can get a um, doctor's order for a pregnancy massage. Okay, they do a very nice job. Lay you on your side and, and, and relax you. Um, you can um, also, you have the waddling gait, which is relaxing of the pelvic joints. And that's caused by a hormone called relaxin, R-E-L-A-X-I-N. And that causes the waddling gait. Okay. You'll see that again. That's a good question. And then again, you have change in the center of gravity. So you don't want to be wearing high heels during the second, third trimester. And because balance can become an issue very easily with this. You want to protect her because if she falls, she could have a complication such as um, placenta abruptio, where the placenta actually comes off the endometrium, the wall of the uterus, and it comes right off that wall, and then she has an abruption, and then that's an obstetrical um, uh, emergency. Okay, let's go on. Nutrition for pregnancy, well, you know, we talked about, you know, during pregnancy, they can increase their nutrition, their calories by 300 calories, get more, make sure you get protein, make sure you're not eating a bunch of chips for those calories. You want to have good substantial nutrients because you have a growing fetus. And so you want to make sure mom understands what's good and what's not good. Okay. All right, we always want moms to read the food labels, okay? And I think more people now are reading the food labels, but we want to re re, you know, reassure them, please do so, because we want to promote the intake of good calories, okay, rather than empty calories. We want to increase protein, have protein rather than sugary foods. And, you know, we want to go by the RDI, which is a recommended dairy, dairy dietary intake. It's just basically that's an umbrella term that includes the RDA um, and the upper levels of intake. So weight gain for a normal height um, woman, um, the guidelines are 25 to 35 pounds that she should gain during their pregnancy. So that's why, you know, you want to make sure that whatever she's taking in is substantial good food rather than empty calories. You don't want that to happen. Um, so again, weight, normal weight gain would be 25 to 35 pounds. A woman who's overweight, 
um, has less, she can gain less. Uh, so she's in an um, area of 11 to 25 pounds. And then obese woman, she has 11 to 15 pounds. Now, if you have twins, so if you have twins, then the woman should gain like four to six pounds in the first trimester. And then she she gains like one and a half pounds per week in the second and third trimester. So she can have a total of from anywhere from 37 to 54 pounds. And that's a, that's a substantial amount of weight gain. So she will have, you know, the discomfort we talked about, cardiovascular, respiratory, eating, GI system, um, urinary. She's going to have some problems with them because of the multiple fetal pregnancy. You have to keep an eye on our twins. And I've had to take care of twins, let me say in the hospital, triplets and quads. Okay, very challenging. Okay, now, normal, um, our requirements for our pregnant ladies, I said 35, 30, 300 calories per day. And this is how they're breaking down, broken down. Protein is 60 grams per day. Calcium is like 1200 milligrams per day. Iron is 30 milligrams per day and folic acid is 400 micrograms or 0 0.4 milligrams per day. Now, I definitely would write that down so you have that, okay? All right. Now, we talked about special nu nutrition considerations, all right? We have our pregnant adolescent. Okay, and you need to go over nutrition with them because they have a tendency to eat more non-nourishing foods such as, you know, potato chips and all that kind of um, candy and all that kind of stuff, which is not good. Um, then you have vegetarians, which is okay. Make sure that, you know, they're eating some kind of protein and they get their fruits and fruits and vegetables. And then you have pica, which is your non-food items. We talked about that already. So just that you want to have a craving for chalk, for soil. Again, as nurses, we understand that this is a normal phenomenon. It happens. But as a, as a nurse, what I want to know is I ask my patient, how much of this chalk are you eating? How much of this soil are you eating? And most of the time they'll say, I just need a little bit. Like I eat a little teaspoon. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I write that down. All right. And then you have patients that are lacto intolerance, which we all know about and cultural preferences and gestational diabetes. Now during lactation, the woman is able to have 500 extra calories. So when I have someone and I'm trying to get to breastfeed, okay, at the delivery, I say to them, you know, you can have 500 extra calories. Now you look at 500 extra calories, that's a lot of calories. All right, so I think I'll breastfeed. All right, again, the protein intake should be high, about 65 milligrams per day. The calcium ion, same as during pregnancy, is for lactation. Vitamins, I always tell my patients, continue that during um, breastfeeding because um, they need the vitamins and then limit your intake of caffeine and alcohol because it goes right through the breast milk to the baby and then drugs should only be taken to the advice of a healthcare provider okay because drugs will 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 cross over to through the breast milk and right to baby now exercise during pregnancy should be maintained there's no, you know, there's no need to all of a sudden want to go for, to do a marathon to prove that I'm still, I still got it. <laughs> no, it's just for maintaining. So the best exercise for a woman during pregnancy would be just get out and walk. You know, if you, and if you live down here in Florida, you want to walk early in the morning or you want to walk around, around sunset. Okay. But it's not so hot. And always, 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 no matter where you live and what kind of exercise you're doing, you always want to hydrate, okay? Always hydrate. Make sure there's, you keep that uterus quiet. Make sure mom gets enough fluid circulating so she doesn't feel bad. But again, there's you don't do exercise during pregnancy for weight loss or for anything else. You do it for maintenance of the fitness. 
You don't want mom to get an elevated temperature because that can impact fetal circulation and cardiac function. So I don't want to overheat mom, okay? When you overheat mom, you overheat baby. You don't want mom's blood pressure to go down, so you want to avoid high pole tension because when your mom's blood pressure goes down, that reduces the blood flow to the fetus. And the fetus needs blood, blood flow because blood, uh, oxygen is carried through the blood. So we need that. Cardiac out, output, you want to make sure that she doesn't overexert herself on, on that because when you know that cardiac increase during pregnancy is tremendous, like 45 to 50%, that's an extra workload on the heart. You don't want her to have more of workload and get um, dizzy, lightheaded, fainting, fainting. You don't want that. Hormones. Hormones, there's some changes in oxygen consumption and like glycogen, cortisol, prolactin, endorphins, you know, they're all those different levels of different hormones um, can increase. So we want to make sure that she doesn't, you know, get too much. So again, moderate exercise has many good benefits. Okay. You get a more positive self-image. Okay. You have decreased the musculoskeletal discomfort during pregnancy, you know, and then um, I, I know from laboring women, the women who are out there busy during pregnancy, um, doing some walking or keeping themselves busy, maybe working, walk, you know, walking during the job, um, they, they do have a tendency to have stronger pelvic muscles. And so they're actually during the second stage of labor, which is your pushing stage, they actually are able to push that baby out more effectively. Also, when you're in, when your body's in a tone, after you deliver, your body will have be more apt to return back to its pre-pregnancy weight a little bit, a little bit quicker. So that's another good, good thing to keep your body, you know, in good tone um, during that time. But again, the, you know, you don't want to go over, don't exceed the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. They just all say moderate exercise and combine that with a balanced diet is great. Eating your fruits and vegetables, great. You take it in calcium, great, okay? Um, it, those are things that you wanna promote during pregnancy, okay? okay. Um, you know, always, you know, whenever you're doing exercise, you should give yourself the talk test. That means, I, you ask yourself, am I able to talk to someone right now? So say you're walking out there and, and you know, you stop to talk to a neighbor. Are you able to carry on a conversation with that neighbor or are you going, oh, are you doing some deep breaths? I, I can't get my breath. I can't get my breath. Okay. If that, if you can't get your breath and you need to sit down and rest for a few minutes in order that your body recuperates quick, quickly. Now travel. A woman can travel during pregnancy and she can travel up to 36 weeks gestation, okay? Now, you don't want to be going to a country that, you know, is, has infectious diseases or, put, or you're going to put yourself at risk or and your fetus at risk. You don't want to do that. So you want to avoid those places that have these exposure problems, all right? And so um, on the plane... You know, you want to get up and walk around the cabin, you know, carefully balancing, not during turbulence time, of course not, but, you know, going to the bathroom because you have to go to the bathroom, but just be careful when you're in there, when you're pregnant and um, you want to, because you don't want to get a DVT, you know, you, you know, when you sit for a long time, you, your, you know, your knees are bent, you know, and, and you can have some blood um, basically being cut off by your knees when you're doing prolonged sitting. So you don't want that. You want to get up and move, move your legs around. So you get you get moving, got to move the blood in the body, got to move the blood. And so I always tell my patients, if you're going to go some, from maybe Florida to New York or to maybe Ohio, you know, for visits, take your obstetrical record with you. Okay. Because uh, not all computers talk to all states. So this way they have their information. You just print it up and they have a complete history of what, what's been done for them since that first prenatal visit. And then 
and they they can take it with them and then if they do go into preterm labor they can see exactly what's been done during the pregnancy otherwise you have to start all over because you go to a hospital say you know i have a lot down here in florida people from up north you know they come down to disney world okay and they come down and she could be like 20 24 weeks gestation and she is walking around disney and it's in the heat because in the summertime it gets really hot down here um and she gets dehydrated very very quickly so then she starts having premature labor because the uterus now is contracting because it's dehydrated so now they bring her to the hospital and so we admit her and we're going to start an IV and hydrate her real quick. And then I always look for the obstetrical history. Did you bring your obstetrical history? Now, if she did not bring it with her, then I have to start. I don't know anything about this lady. I don't know if she, HIV. I don't know if she's anemic. I have no idea because I don't have anything to go by. And then everything has to be reordered. Insurance companies don't take, don't take light to that. They don't like it. So bring the obstetrical history. It's very valuable. Um, and of course, you know, hand hygiene on planes are, is vital too. You know, there's a lot of germs circulating in an airplane. So you can be very careful. And then of course, I always tell my patient, please drink some fluids before you go on the plane. So you want to get, you know, oral hydration in there. So you want to make sure that they're hydrated before they go on the plane. And then you have some changes while you're in the, in the plane, you want to drink fluids on the plane and then when you get off the plane you rehydrate so just to kind of summarize all the discomforts in pregnancy yes she can feel fatigue she does have some nasal stuffiness related to hormonal change especially estrogen nausea vomiting especially in the first trimester up to 13 weeks by week 14 if it's just normal nausea vomiting in pregnancy Usually after week 14, it tends to die down. It gets a lot better. Well, then she gets heartburn, okay? And then she has constipation. And then because of constipation, maybe she's put a lot of pressure when she had a bowel movement. Now she's got hemorrhoids. Okay. Um, she can also have vaginal discharge because she had more um, secretion from the barfling glands in the vagina in order to, you know, get the vagina lubricated for childbirth, you know, at, uh, and when it's time. A backache, backache because of the lordiosis, the increased weight in the front. She can have a really good backache. And then you got varicosities or varicose veins, and they can be bulging. They can be very uncomfortable, and you might have to have maybe compression stockings given to you, and um, that's not comfortable either. And they do not wear them during pregnancy. Too, just too much, too hot. Leg cramps, yes, and so you want to make sure she gets enough nutrients to make sure that she doesn't get the leg cramps. Edema of the lower extremities, especially at the end of the day, or you've been sitting for hours, you know, your your legs are in a dependent position and they can swell. And during pregnancy, because of the estrogen progesterone, the sodium retention, you can get more swelling. And so I tell them, go put your legs up at the end of the day. Okay. Um, we also have some psychological changes or psychosocial changes during pregnancy. Um, and so we have to identify them and manage them as best we can because we want to have a positive outcome in the pregnancy. That's why the very beginning of pregnancy is good to know all about your patient. And does she have any history of depression? Okay. Does she, has she been diagnosed with bipolar disorder? You want to know those because during pregnancy, those things don't go away. They actually get worse. They escalate. And so you want to know about that. Nutritional needs, you want to know about that. So remember something. Pregnancy is a time of stress and big changes for both the pregnant woman and her family. There's no doubt about it. And the needs and concern of each pregnant woman will vary by where they are demographically. Now, Riva Rubin is a psychologist that identified four maternal tasks that a woman does go through as she, you know, goes through her pregnancy, okay? And so she has to see, and she realizes that she has to have a safe passageway for her further growth, for herself and the fetus. 
she knows that you know one day this baby's gonna have to come out okay so she want to have a safe passage so she's concerned about that and then she wants to secure accepting of herself as a mother and for her for herself and for her fetus she wants to be a good mom okay that's that's not these are not easy for a woman to 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 get through and then she has to learn to give of herself and to receive the care and concern of others. Yeah, so she has to, maybe she's been on her own and now she's pregnant. So now she has to know she has to give her herself, okay? And then committing herself to the child as she progresses through pregnancy, okay? Because what she does, what she does will affect the fetus. So that's a way of committing herself. I got to take care of me. I've got to listen to those, those providers that are telling me to eat right, to sleep, to um, be happy, okay? That has a lot to do with psychosocial, okay? And, you know, I need I need to do these things. I need to take care of me. I need to take care of me so I could have a healthy baby. Daddies also go through the developmental stages, all right? So, you know, they could be shocked too when the announcement comes out you know, okay, pregnancy is confirmed. We have that 10 week ultrasound and we see that little growing fetus. That's pretty obvious, dad, that there is a pregnancy. And sometimes it does take those um, for a man to realize that his wife is pregnant, um, is that they go to the ultrasound. That's the best thing. To drag them into the ultrasound to show them, yes, we are pregnant, dear. And then accepting. So they go through a period where they have to accept a pregnancy and they have to see the strengthening of their family. Okay. Because once they accept the pregnancy, it does give solidity um, to the pregnancy and to the couple. The couple comes together as a little family and saying, we're going to get through this. Okay. We're, we're together and we're strong. Okay. And then they go through an adjustment time. We're now, okay, we are pregnant and we're all going to get this, get through this together. And we have to make maybe some adjustments to our lifestyle. Yeah. Um, maybe they won't be going out as much, especially after, after she has the baby is because they're in another now social group um, because of, you know, they have a baby, they have a responsibility. So there is a lot of adjustment time, but it's a good time and um, usually a ha happier time. And then they focus. Okay. And the focus is on active plans for participation in like labor and the birth process. Yeah. They're ready. All right. And you, you know, I encourage um, daddies to attend the prenatal education classes. Um, I used to teach those at the hospital and, and basically there are a lot of fun to teach and I love to see the interaction of the husbands with their wives. So there are some big impacts on the dad. And there's to be some cultural values that have may influence the role of dads because pregnancy and birth sometimes in some cultures they're only viewed as exclus exclusively as women's women's work. Okay, so the dads have nothing to do with that. But as a nurse, I do not assume that a father is uninterested or he takes less active role in pregnancy and birth. Okay, no, you you want to know their culture and know you know, how is pregnancy and birthing viewed in their culture? And then the acceptance of the pregnancy results in strengthening of the family support system. And like, like I told you, an expansion of the social network. So these are some questions just to kind of ponder about. Um, how, why has the role of the father changed over the past decades? They have changed dramatically over the past decades. And I think it's for the betterment. Um, years ago, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, daddies were not allowed in the delivery room. Um, and then the 80s, we changed that a little bit by saying, if you go to the prenatal classes with your wife, you get your little card and signed off by the instructor, I'll let you in the labor room, okay? That was really strongly enforced, I'm going to let you know. Because I have, I have a cute little story I'm going to share with you. I was a young nurse in labor and delivery, working the night shift. And um, I knew about daddies needing to have that little card. Okay. 
So the patient comes in, she's in active labor. So it means just she's like, you know, her, she's quite dilated. She's like five, six centimeters. So she's an active phase of the first stage of labor. So she is, you know, really breathing, very vocal. She's scared. She's young. And the husband wanted to come back with her. And I said to him, sir, do you have your little card? And he looked at me, my little card. Well, I went to the prenatal classes. I said, I know, but I need to see the cards. I need to just make a copy for the chart. So I have it. Okay. So he says, oh, I left it at home. I said, okay. He says, but I did did attend the class. He he was broken hearted. He was crying. And, I'm, and again, I'm a young nurse. I'm going, well, why can't they go back? You know? And so I'm I'm in a different mind frame than a lot of my colleagues that are a lot older than me um, were thinking. So I looked at him and he and his wife was crying in the room. And I looked at him and he was crying out here by the nurse station. So I looked inside. I'll tell you, if you help me get her through this labor um, by coaching her, by breathing with her and encouraging her, I said, you can come in the labor room. And what we have, have to have a pack. I have to have her delivered by six o'clock in the morning because that's when the day shift starts to arrive. And they're going to want to know where's your little card. And so he says, okay, 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 yeah, I'll help you. I'll help her breathe. I'll help her breathe. I'll be very, very helpful. I said, okay. So I let him come back in and we had a, a good labor and she did deliver by five o'clock in the morning. So back those in those days, we had to go back, take the patient back to the OR to deliver and get her on the table and everything is good. Doctor delivers the baby. Mom and baby go to postpartum. Daddy goes with them. You know, everything is good. And everything was copacetic. Hey, so we had a good, good labor and beautiful delivery. And everything was done by what? Six o'clock in the morning. It was wonderful. So anyway, that's my, that's my personal experience with having a daddy in the room being very helpful in coaching the woman during the active phase during her labor. Okay, so, um, you know, just you wanna think about how we have evolved in, in maternity from back in, the, back in the 40s and 50s up to where we are now. It's quite interesting. Okay, another area I wanna to touch upon is the adolescent, okay? And I know discussion number two is um for this this week and it goes over adolescence you know and so adolescence is a time of change and adjustment all right so you know the pregnant adolescent faces you know multiple hurdles as she transitions both developmental and during pregnancy yeah it's hard it's not easy and the nurse must assess the girl's developmental and educational level absolutely as well as her support system to buy the best care for her. So what I did, I, I have a um, true story about this one also, because I have labored a lot of different groups of women. And I did have, I remember this one in particular, it was in Houston, Texas, and she was a very young girl, very, very young. And when I say young, I mean like 12. Okay. Like sh she actually got pregnant just as she had her first period but that's so hard you know you know she had a first period and then she got pregnant so um it was it was actually you know it's kind of sad too but we knew who, who, who did it. it it was in the in the family so um I labored her and so she hurt tremendously and what I had to do I had to first assess when I first met her to assess you know, how she felt about everything, how she felt toward the pregnancy, how she felt, you know, now that she's in labor and how we're going to breathe. And she didn't go through any classes. So we had to teach her how to breathe real quick and just help her get through. Okay. Um, and so it's not easy because um, their bones are not as mature as say a grown woman who is now giving birth. So there is a, there's a little more, um, discomfort uh, element that goes into that too and we made it very much so so my question to you to ponder about is what potential concerns are most likely to be experienced by the present the pregnant adolescent think about it you know 
I mean, real young children having children. This was a Time Magazine article, and you can probably go in the library and pull this up. And it's interesting to see um, what what concerns, okay? Because there are a lot. Because don't forget, adolescence is a very stressful time. It's a time of transition from you know, going from childhood into adolescence. And to think now you go from childhood um, ad into adolescence and parenthood. That's a lot for a, a teenager to really accept and to um, to deal with, very much so. And not only for her, but she, you know, don't forget she has a growing fetus. <laughs> and a lot of times adolescents don't eat right. Well, one, oh, sometimes they're very good at camouflaging you know, getting through almost a whole pregnancy all the way to the end of the third trimester and nobody knows they're even pregnant. They just thought she gained a lot of weight because she's wearing bigger clothes. Number two, you know, um, we used to have a lot of babies born in um, not so nice places. And um, then they used to take the baby and put them in garbage cans <coughs> to get rid of them. Now we have a place called Safe Haven where um, is that police station, fire departments, hospitals, where moms, the teenager can bring her the baby that she delivered and put him into this area called, it's like little, I don't know, little area that you can place the baby in and close it. And that, you know, the, the bell goes off on the other side when the baby's put in there and the, and and practitioner runs there and grabs the baby and you cannot open it to see in, in, on the other side. Once she closes that lid, um, is it's not, it's not accessible to anybody. And so the practitioner is on the other side is accessible and, and so grabs the baby. It's one way of making sure that these young ladies that are delivering these babies don't just dump them in the garbage can. That's what safe haven is all about. And we want to provide that. You can you can give your baby up and no problem whatsoever. And um, you know, no questions asked. None. No questions asked. And so therefore, you know, it's better for the baby. All right. So if I was to ask you a question, what would be the first priority? in working with a present pregnant adolescent. I'll give you a few minutes to look at that. All right. So remember, like I told you, assess her attitude toward the pregnancy. Yeah, she if she comes into your clinic, it's great. I love when they show up. Okay. And so then I want to know how she feels. I'm going to ask her about her first. Don't forget, adolescence is all about me, you know? Okay. So I want to find out how, which, how she feels first before I start in on nutrition and all that. So I'm glad that she shows up for her first prenatal visit. Um, the older couples, another group that we talk about, um, and they're usually well-educated. They usually have achieved their life experiences. You know, they had their goals, you know, they maybe they are now president of a company. And so now they decide to have a baby. Sperms are good in a male up to age 55. So sperms are better, you know, live longer and they're, they're, they don't get deformed after, until after 55, then the sperm starts to what we call aging process. They get, they get older. Therefore, then they can change. Um, the ovaries, though, um, the ovums, they are good and healthy to age 35. And then it shows at the age 35 that they start having some changes. They start the aging, they start having some changes in the com configuration and the chromosomes too. So that's what happens after age 35. And it's why we have to be very careful our older women having babies. And that's why we want to do those tests to make sure that, you know, we we know if they're if all the chromosomes lined up correctly um, or there is a, a problem. Now, you know, every every group, 
every group has unique concerns and unique needs, okay? So, um, you know, they may be faced with, again, like I said before, you know, peer groups, you know, um, not going out as much, okay? And they also have more maybe health needs. Mom, mom is older, so she needs more testing done to make sure that those chromosomes are, are good. So maybe she has to have an amniocentesis in the beginning. That puts it as a risk, that puts stress on the pregnancy. Um, so there's all, always health concerns, you know, preeclampsia. Um, the a AMA patient is more prone to getting preeclampsia after 20 weeks gestation, such as the adolescent too, by the way. Um, they also have the problem of preeclampsia, um, like the 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds have more problems with, with preeclampsia. So um, all these groups um, have their unique concerns and needs. And as nurses, um, we are there to help them. All right, and then, you know, because of all the great contraception we have today, these women are able to wait, okay? So they're able to, you know, have their careers started, you know, careers pretty well, you know, solidified by this time. Um, they, you know, they have their house or their condo, whatever they like. And so then they decide then to um, go for the pregnancy. A single mom, um, she may be an adolescent or, you know, a mature woman, you know, having a baby. Um, they also have their unique needs, emotional needs. Um, they need places to be able to talk and to get help and to know what's out there, such as community resources, which are so, so important to know, you know, how can we help? Well, say that adolescent, um, where can we refer her to so that we know she gets proper food? We know she can get formula for the baby if she's if she's um, not going to breastfeed. Make sure she knows where she can get clothes and make, get food, lodging, all those different things. Okay, and so that's why a nurse should have um, good resources that she can refer to um, when she has these kind of um, different groups that she needs to help. Again, nurses, we always approach any group, any culture in a non-judgmental manner, uh, always, always. And it could be that, you know, the role of the father with this baby may, you know, it's just an individual um, preference, individual matter. You don't ever, nurses never make assumptions, okay? You never do any of those kind of things. You never judge, okay? You're there to get your patient through the pregnancy. If you're in the hospital, labor and delivery, you get, you're there to get them through the labor and birth. If you're there for postpartum, you're there to take care of mom and baby and to get give them everything they need, give them the education and the support that they need so that when they leave the hospital, they're able to take care of themselves and the baby. Yeah, because single daddies is another very, very unique um, group. Um, you know, they're, they're not married to the woman. They may have an active interest. They might not, okay? Um, they may participate in the plans for the child, and they might not. Um, it, it just... They have to work together. You know, they came together to make a baby. They have to work together to take care of this baby. And grandparents. Grandparents usually um, are there to help be a good support person for the, for, the, for the pregnancy and for taking care of the baby. Okay. Even our grandparents of adolescents, um, they have a tendency to come around you know, there may be some conflict in the very beginning, maybe all shocked, okay? But they should be able, as as mature um, beings, they should be able to negotiate and to work out the different um, conflicts that occur, among, you know, among the different generations. So we're looking at a little bit about prenatal education. Um, prenatal education should progress according to the nursing process. Okay, a good old, um, this looks like ad pie here. So um, assess the history and cultural needs. Okay, we always do that. 
we're going to always have diagnosed the, the knowledge deficit. In your care plan, um, this, you know, be sure to include good nursing diagnosis. And a good one is always on knowledge deficit, okay? Because most of your patients are not well-versed on everything. And so you always can see that there's a need for knowledge. Okay, plan your goals and your priorities as you take care of this patient. I, outcomes um, are identified. And then I want to teach her. I want to teach her whatever she, uh, wherever her deficits are and, and um, whatever nursing diagnosis I, I gave her for knowledge deficit, I want to teach her, okay? And so you teach the facts and give the reasons why. And then can and then as like every good nurse does, she evaluates what she's done. You acknowledge you evaluate your knowledge gain and are the goals achieved. And so we want to do that. Okay. Um lactation pregnancy on take when you take in medications. Okay. So pregnancy does affect the metabolism of medications. Some of them are affected so much that they have sub therapeutic levels, so they don't work as well. Um, so you have to be just careful. Just remember something. This is what I want you to remember: that drugs do cross the placenta, and they can be and they, they can be passed through breast milk. So whatever you're taking, you need to let the practitioner know what you're taking, so the practitioner can say. Um, yes, you can continue breastfeeding or no, you can't. Like HIV patient, HIV positive patient, they cannot breastfeed. Okay. So um, if, if a baby has an abnormal um, metab errors of metabolism problem, such as even maple syrup or, um, syndrome, or, um, they can't breastfeed or glycosemia, too much glucose in the, in, in the blood of the baby, you can't tolerate it. Um, you can't breastfeed. If the baby has positive for PKU, you can't breastfeed because you cannot have proteins with PKU because they can't break down the fetal thylene in the protein. So these are things that, these are reason why that you tell the practitioner and the practitioner will tell you either you can breast milk, breastfeed or you cannot. But most of the time, with most of the time, you can breastfeed. Um, these are just category drugs. Remember, when you give her, give mom a drug, there's always a risk to a growing fetus. So like category A, there's no risk, okay, um, that's been demonstrated to the fetus in any trimester, which is a good thing, okay? That means you could take it all the way through and be no problem. But you get into category B, C, okay, D, not good, and category X is absolutely very bad for a fetus, okay? You have absolute uh, fetal anomalies and cannot be used anytime during pregnancy, okay? So these are different drugs. Um, we talked about live viruses. They are contraindicated during pregnancy. That means they cannot be given during pregnancy. And so you don't wanna do that, such as rubella cannot be given during pregnancy. And so, you know, she can't even, it, it, she can't, she can't, at all have it, you know, during pregnancy. So, but when you have her postpartum, now that she has delivered the baby and she's on the postpartum unit, you can give her the rubella vaccine and there's no problems. The thermosol should not be given during pregnancy due to risk of mercury poisoning. And then, so you just want to make sure that, you know, your immunization are things that, you can, they can have such as maybe Tdap, you know, that one, the influenza vaccine, but never a live virus. Well, this concludes um, my review on chapter four. So hope you enjoyed it. Make sure that you read um, the key points at the end of the chapter. And um, we did post some things on the resource page that have um, the highlights from um, week one. And so it takes a few minutes to look at that. And I think that's it. Okay. It was a pleasure to um, see you today and I hope you enjoy the review and always keep reading, keep studying, and always look forward to the, to um, the end. Okay. Write down your goals. Okay. And you will achieve them.
All right, like Walt Disney, since I live here in Florida, I'm a Disney person. So Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. And that's how I feel too. If you can dream it, you can do it. Bye-bye, everybody.